I know Dr. Kelly later on will give us all the time frames to the <laughs> finish line. I know we'll be glad to get to the finish line. So I'm going to go ahead and call this workshop to order, and we'll move down the line here. So Section 2 will be approval of the agenda. Uh, section 3, we'll have 3.1, recognition of Savian Harris, Crestview High School student, for his heroic actions in saving a human life. And of course, he's been all over the news the last couple of weeks and receiving a lot of accolades. So I felt, with, along with Mr. Chambers, that it was fitting that the school board would also take Absolutely. that opportunity to recognize him. And 3.2, recognition of Carolyn Orcutt, Fort Walton Beach High School, recipient of the 2020 National High School Heisman Scholarship Award. And 3.3, recognition of Carolyn Orcutt, recipient of the 2021 All Sports a Association Female Scholastic Award. And uh, in our agenda meeting the other day, I asked, was there any more or cuts coming up the line? Because uh, the last few years, so. all of the whole family has been recognized and we're really proud of the or cuts. So. And then 3.4, recognition of the Niceville High School Eagleette Dance Team State Champions 2021 Universal Dance Association Florida Championships small varsity hip-hop division and section four will be visitors uh, section five an exciting night on monday we have the appointment of principal crestview high school and 5.2 the appointment of principal eglin elementary school and i understand the bios will be out if they haven't already been sent out i didn't see them this morning but there. were they there That's okay right. and but that was like uh, I knew those were coming out. So section six will be public comment 6.1 uh, members of the public desired to address the school board forum MIS 5241 public input and or discussion of agenda items. Uh, section seven is committee and staff report 7.1 in county travel paid for the period of March 4th through the 24th uh, 2021 out of county travel paid uh, the same time period and then 7.3 uh, student record security update and out of the request of Dr. White Mr. Mitchell was here this morning to kind of give us a update on secure on security with involving student records so, Mr. Mitchell Good morning board members Good morning, Good morning. Uh, I was asked to present to the board about the security situation that happened in Escambia County with their student information or SIS um, and whether or not that type of security event could happen here. What happened in Escambia uh, was not a hack. It was not a breach. It was not anything from outside the district. What happened in Escambia was an internal issue for them. Um, in the scenario an elementary school administrator, which had access to all K-12 students in their SIS system, uh, allegedly that employee used and allowed that system to gain access to over 300 student records or accounts in this matter. Um, this was not anything more than an abuse of power or an abuse of the privileges, the security privileges that had been granted to that particular employee. Here in Okaloosa, we limit as much as we possibly can the access rights of users and our data to only allow for the access necessary to perform the duties prescribed. We do this to protect the data we're federally required to protect. We have annual checks to ensure there's not a need to reduce access levels on employees. We also have spot checks for certain positions to ensure that their access permissions don't overlap into areas that create overreaching authority. An example of overreaching authority would be someone who has the ability to write a program and then the ability to deploy a program. You don't give those two scenarios to the same person or they could write a program to steal money and then deploy it. So you have a, somebody in between that does that. We do checks for that all the time. And there's checks for that in HR, finance, and programming. Um, in addition, both the Scambia and Okaloosa have in place safeguards that would allow us to track inappropriate use. Brought to our attention, it was reported 
that the district knew which devices were accessing the data and when, and those tools are in our tool belt as well. So we can do those same kind of searches and produce that same kind of information. Just so you know, when you talk about security of the district, for the last seven days I ran a report for how our external protection goes. Now this is not what we're talking about in Escambia. This is when outside users try to come into us and steal our data. For the last seven days, we blocked 2.1 million connection attempts from uh, fraudulent websites. We blocked 990,000 malicious websites from either being accessed from within or coming into us from without. 1.9 million VPN connections were denied. That's where people were trying to hack our system by connecting remotely and having access. And then we have our system set to block, um, and it honestly, in, in a week's time, it's millions, uh, of inappropriate advertising links. So instead of seeing an inappropriate ad pop up, they get a blocker that says you can't see this ad or whatever. We do that constantly. We also filter inappropriate emails. We monitor internal connections. And we have real-time reporting on all our servers and network switches. So if something goes down, or something's not right, it sends us a message and lets us know right away. All that is in place. Um, my final thoughts on the matter fall in line with Escambia's response to the issue. We have a policy in place that outlines employee responsibility to security. Specifically, policy 05-09, section A, and policy 06-37, paragraphs 3, 8, 9, 10, 12, and 14. So we have made sure that through our policy, should something like this try to happen in our district, we have the, the necessary tools to deal with that from a human resource side. And uh, that's a general overview of what went down. If you have any questions, I can answer those now. Now, yes. school board members, real quick before we do ask questions, just so you know, there might be some questions that can't be answered uh, due to security reasons, but uh, the floor is open, Dr. Kelly. I was just going to say, first of all, thank you for blocking all the car warranty <laughs> communications. <laughs> but, but secondly, I would submit that almost all of these kinds of breaches in school districts have nothing to do with the paperwork that all employees sign verifying that we will not abuse our responsibilities or our access, but have everything to do with a person's internal moral and ethic compass. And that's what's happened here and what happened in the one in another district last year and prior to that and even in our own district. Well, Mr. Mr. do I remember when we were talking that you have uh, addressed or these, some of these individuals that have this access as far as what's proper and what's not proper, like some training? You, yes, there like is that. training through this system. Right. Uh, I'll be honest with you, I think that the uh, the report that Channel 3 did would make a great training video. Uh, and we, We've reached out to them to acquire that to for that like purpose, to remind that. folks mm -hmm. that, you know, this is more serious, to treat this as serious as you need to, and this is and why. Not give out their passwords. Um, exactly. But uh, yes, uh, we have that in place. We also have, um, um, like I said, the spot checks. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that the people who have that level of authority still need it as their positions change. We always track when someone changes position from one to another, or we, we got to make sure we turn off certain positions and turn on certain other ones to make sure that they get so what they only need great job for that. Mm -hmm. and, and I just follow up with that, and Mr. Mitchell will say that um, it's, it's good to know that, that the school district uh, establishes privileges for these passwords. And uh, I don't know what percent of our employees would have global access. Uh, but I suspect it's very, very small. It is. And, and so by setting up those kinds of barriers, I think that certainly helps protect us from uh, a serious breach of, uh, of student records or, or other kinds of security. I very much appreciated you sharing the information about the malicious uh, forays, uh, attempts uh, into our district system. 
Uh, I'm sure the board members and you have recently read about Broward, I believe it was, has been hijacked and uh, demand of several millions of dollars mm -hmm. to get their data back. And uh, I think that uh, what I heard was that uh, they offered $500,000, but that that was declined by the ransom people. So, so these kinds of things are very real, mm -hmm. and I appreciate the effort and the work that you guys do to, to prevent us from being hacked or having our data stolen or getting these malicious emails. Sometimes I, I'll say that uh, uh, those, those kind of things can produce uh, some consternation uh, because uh, I know for a fact that in one case, at least my case, and I suspect my board member colleagues received an email that was automatically placed in the junk folder uh, by the district and thereby uh, I don't routinely read the junk folder emails. I don't know about you colleagues. Uh, but in any case, that was an email from a citizen, and uh, I had to explain that, listen, uh, emails that are unknown or, or may contain information, uh, the district system works to prevent those kinds of things from getting to us. But uh, I'll occasionally now open my junk email folder just to, to look and see if there's anything in there that uh, I, I might need to know about. And uh, the fact that you gave all of those attempts uh, explains to people why we have to do that kind of thing because uh, we can be victimized mm -hmm. and we can be held for ransom as in the case of one of our other Florida counties and uh, I just appreciate the work you do and your staff and everyone else and uh, I know that sometimes it makes it a little frustrating when people do need access to something that their password doesn't give them privileges to but I also know, I remember that you guys work with them to, to make happen whatever needs to happen. And uh, I appreciate the report and I, I appreciate the sense of security you've given me with your security report. We spend a lot of time, especially in our communications with Teleforce, or excuse me, Titan now, I've changed names, but um, with that fine line of what is, what is security overreach? What's too much to ask our teachers to do? And then we, com we, we balance that with what the audit requirements come in with to make sure that we're being as absolutely as secure as we possibly can, but at the same time doing that without impacting instruction. We do that all the time. All right. All right, thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you. All right, so now we will move down to section eight, the consent agenda. 8.1 will be approval of the consent agenda. 8.2, approval of the minutes of the student dis disciplinary hearing of March 18, 2021. Minutes of workshop meeting of March 18, 2021. Minutes of regular meeting of March 22, 2021. Uh, 8.3, request to advertise a public hearing for elementary English language arts textbook instructional materials adoption. 8.4, request to advertise a public hearing for adoption of a new job description for program director curriculum. Eight I did have a question about that, if I might. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate the organizational information you gave us at our meeting, and I thought that I had on my notes that there were two curriculum positions you were asking for. Are we just approving one tonight and another is to come later? I'm not sure Monday what you're referring night. to unless you're talking about the data scientist position, which that job mm -hmm. description has already come forward. Not that one, but I'll get with you later. Okay. And you can clarify my notes for me. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, 8.5, request to advertise a public hearing for adoption of a new job description for Director 1 Information Systems. 8.6, request to advertise a public hearing for adoption of a new job description for Information Systems Database Official. 8.7, request to advertise a public hearing for adoption of a new job description for MIS IT Security Official. I'd like to make a comment. Yes, ma'am. If the public is watching this, that was several job positions that we're looking at, but um, might be noted that uh, even though that appears that we're adding those, there's some changes with uh, retirements and different things where these are spread out and that it's my understanding that all of this is coming out pretty much cost neutral to our district, correct? Yes, ma'am, and just as a reminder, I think uh, 
maybe it may have been a month and a half ago, maybe more, I just reminded the board that uh, we'll be bringing forward some job descriptions um, in anticipation of an organizational chart for the next school year, um, but with the commitment and the promise that this will be a cost neutral uh, district org chart, so we will not be adding uh, additional dollars to our org chart, but we will be uh, cost neutral. Right, yeah, thank you. And, and, I, and I would like to follow up, Mr. Yes, Chairman, sir. Yes, sir. and say that uh, I, I eagerly look forward to seeing that organizational chart because I think that will help us and the public all understand that uh, every new administration has ideas and proposals for how they believe that they might better run the school district. And uh, so uh, I look forward to seeing the superintendent's new administration's organizational chart for what, what he proposes, uh, how we might make our system better. And then we'll move to section 8.8, .8, uh, invoice to be approved for payment, 8.9, school donations, 8.10, proposed school operational support staffing grid and school supplement grid, discretionary budget for fiscal year 2021 through 2022. 8.11 fiscal year 2021 through 2020. Can we go back to 8.2? 8, 8 oh, yes, sir. Chair? Yes, sir. And I, I know that Ms. Callan, you, you sent a lengthy uh, or have attached a lengthy uh, document. And, and so I'm wondering if you might speak to it just for a moment, if that's all right, Mr. Chairman. Of course. Because, because this really gets to the heart of the funding mm -hmm. of, of the school district. Yes, sir. Um, since um, 2014, um, we had we had site-based um, budgeting model up until that point, I and at that point we transitioned to a, a hybrid system, and so um, with that transition, there was a standardized um, st school staffing grid that was put in place, and as you'll recall from that budget um, that school board meeting that each year we would bring back that school staffing chart to you for approval and that um, that you also asked the superintendent to look from year to year um, the functionality um, if there were needed revisions changes and so each year we've done that since that time period and so for the 21-22 school year um, basically the school staffing chart is the same as last year except for two changes okay. and, and, and in the documents that are attached the items that are highlighted in blue are things that happened during the year and there was only one change and that was um, at the STEM Center a reduction of a position there and then going forward for the new year the only proposed change is that um, the high schools have banned assistance and one of the high schools has fallen below the 1500 right. um, and so in order to keep continuity of that program um, the superintendent is recommending that we um, change that to where all high schools regardless of the, of the amount of FTE uh, retain that position because it does not it does not um, mean that your band program has changed significantly um, so so for that continuity that is the only proposed change for the 21-22 year so we're staying at status quo basically and things are working as they should and okay all right. any Does other questions for Ms. Keller? all right thank you Okay, so now we'll move to section 8.11, 8 fiscal year 2021 through 2022 child care fees. 8.12, payroll calendars for 2021 through 2022. 8.13, fuel purchasing agreement between School Board of Okaloosa County, Florida and Blackman Fire District. And it's always kind of interesting to see who we have partnerships with and the little community of black men all the way up there near the Alabama state line I can uh, it's pretty interesting to see that we're going to be helping them out with this fuel mm -hmm. purchase agreement so uh, 8.14 facility use over five thousand dollars cross point United Methodist Church 8.15 ITB 21-08 chilled water piping insulation services at Niceville High School and I understand this is a much needed project to help uh, get them up to the 21st century when it comes to uh, 
the insulation and all. So look forward to seeing the completion of that. And 8.16 request price increase of I, for ITB 18-07 custodial equipment and repair services district wide. 8.17 renewal of ITB 17-03 fire extinguishers and kitchen hood systems inspection maintenance and repair. 8.18 renewal of ITB 19-07 painting bid district wide. 8.19 renewal of RFQU 17-01 construction cost engineering consulting services. 8.20 renewal of tag on bid annual agreement for professional environmental consultant services. I have a question please. Yes ma'am. When we are looking at um, for example, we had the painting here and some other construction costs. My question is now with the sales tax. I know we have things designated for our sales tax under that program. And then, of course, we already have capital funds of certain things that we would be doing regardless. So um, when we have things on the agenda, how, how do we know which is coming under which category? Does that make any sense? For example, on the painting, is that, uh, I, I would assume that's something we'd be doing anyway. Can you yes, help with that or can we get that designated when this information is put in front of the board, which is which, please? Yes, ma'am, we can do that. And so in this case, that painting bid is for schools that have small painting projects to do, front office painting or classroom painting. It's not necessarily school-wide, but it could be. But any time that a project's listed on the sales tax project list, um, it could be funded through this particular contract, but we'd make sure from a financial standpoint, we, we identify that it's from the sales tax project list. So we'll, yeah. we'll be able to provide that information to you. Don't you think, fellow board members, that might be helpful as we are going forward with these projects if we know this is coming under what we have designated with the sales tax. It just seems yes, to me. And, the, and these items here are not actually expending funds. They're just making sure that we have these vendors in place to sure. do services right. for us. Right. And then we, we bring back um, any other items yes. as, as appropriate to the board. And, and that's, okay. a, that's an important point. I used to get so excited when I would see this and I would think my whole school is going to get painted. <laughs> And then someone told me, no, I had to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> We're working on that too, Dr. Yeah. Yeah. They're just making sure we have the painters in place. Oh, I remember. Right. I know. That's what I learned. Right. You had the money the school was going to be paying. Yeah. Right. That's when you quickly went and looked at your budget. Went, yeah, yeah. Man, I can't. Sure. Right. Yeah. Maybe one room. Yeah, one room. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Horton? Okay. I see he's already sitting down. So uh, 8.21 renewal of tag on bid ITB 19-0036 basketball, tennis, play courts resurfacing with line striping and repairs. 8.22 exempted purchase over $25,000 curriculum associates. 8.23 exempted purchase over $25,000 curriculum associates. 8.24, exempted purchase over $25,000, Follett. 8.25, service agreement number 21-69, Carol Ann Whitten. 8.26, service agreement number 21-70, Lori Hagel. 8.27, Triumph, Triumph Gulf Coast Incorporated application for funding to create artificial intelligence learning uh, institutes and do we want Mr. Horton to come up and talk yes, about that? Yes, if you, if you would allow us to do so, Mr. Horton. And as he comes up, um, this, is a, this is an interesting venture um, with, uh, with some timelines associated uh, to it. So appreciate being able to bring this uh, forward to the board, but really looking at some artificial intelligence institutes, um, really starting small to be able to grow um, this program in the school district. So Mr. Horton has some information, uh, some exciting information on where we're going in this venture. So um, we want to partner with the University of Florida and their um, Herbert Wertheim College of Engineering. We would like to partner with the UF Reef facility. Uh, we want to work with the military and we believe that there is a gap in K-12 education as it relates to artificial intelligence. Uh, it will be it will be what um, the future looks like and is now, five, ten years down the road. Um, when we talk about artificial intelligence, we're talking about computer um, uh, learning and getting students to understand the, the, that, that this sort of a process 
is embedded in all industry right now. Uh, when you look at an Amazon or you look at a, um, any kind of logistics company, uh, how they maximize what they're doing and how they serve their customers is through, our, is through AI. And I may have mentioned this before, if you take out your iPhone and you, you take a picture with your iPhone, it's not really you taking a picture. There are eight pictures being taken simultaneously by the computer in that camera and it works with the pixels individually to determine the best possible outcome. So it makes you look like a great photographer, <laughs> but in fact um, there's, some, there's some learned um, processes going on in there to make sure that, that you get the best outcome. Um, in our area, um, drone technology and unmanned aerial is huge, and so when we're working with the University of Florida, who will help us develop curriculum for this program, uh, that will be a big component of it. Uh, augmented reality. Uh, we were just at a meeting, but augmented reality is huge. And so by that we mean uh, if you hold up your phone and you point it with your camera to a particular building, that you get overlays on your screen that talk about that building or what's going on inside of it and, and that sort of thing. So it's not virtual reality, but it's augmented. So if I, you know, in, 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 if I were to, 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 to hold my phone over the Oklahoma Island Pier someday, 15 years in the future, it might tell me what was caught the previous day, what's the best bait to use, what's the hours of operation. So, so these things are coming. And I think that it would be stagnant thinking of us not to help to prepare our students to do um, to be able to function in that world. So, so whether it's careers as uh, in, in these new career fields are being opened all the time, big data engineers, um, AI architects for firms, or, or if it's just working um, um, in, in a, what we now think is a traditional job, um, artificial intelligence and, and computer assistance is going to grow bigger and bigger. So we're proposing um, this particular grant application to Triumph um, and hopefully it will be favorably received. That, that would ask for uh, $3.47 million in Triumph Grant funding based on industry certifications that our students will earn as a result of this. So over the next six years, um, we'll produce additional certifications in our school district. And, and to be honest with you, some of the certifications are yet to be known. And that's why there's not a specific list of them here. Um, we're gonna be working with um, the Department of Education and, and local industry to identify outcomes for students in this field. So it's very exciting. I know Mr. Chambers has been interested in, in making sure that we do K-12 CTE, so the proposal calls for um, some work in four, at the fourth grade level that will, that will fit in nicely with the, the coding program that's going on in elementary schools, uh, also at grade seven and at 11 and 12 initially, and then we would expand that uh, both vertically in our, in our grade levels but also among different schools. So, so that's the exciting part of it. Now, the funding on our part, because the Triumph uh, organization, rightfully so, um, asks for school districts to have some skin in the game, some matching funds. And it's a perfect opportunity right now, I believe, um, because the, the ESSER funding that's been coming to the district and will continue to come, it is clearly articulated in those funds that some of that, those funds be used for things like learning loss, um, for, for improving our, our infrastructure and our buildings um, to make sure we're, our buildings are better. Um, but, but also in that ESSER uh, documentation is funding that, that, to provide funding for things that uh, the Carl Perkins grant also can support. And Carl Perkins, for those that don't know, um, is the career technical education um, funding source. And it's not, not large every year, um, but it, it does help our program. So when we saw that, we latched onto it. And so the proposal that we would like to send to Triumph um, puts in as a matching this um, a $2.6 million uh, roughly in funds that we hope to gain from the ESSER 3 uh, allotment that's coming to the school district. And so in that way, we'd be able to start what we think is a transformational program that does not uh, dip into our general fund to support, but in fact relies on these uh, one-time funds that, come in, that are coming from the federal government and, and then combined with Triumph, we think we can develop a model. Um, the proposal is for one year of planning and we do ask for some personnel funded through this grant to be able to liaise with the University of Florida uh, and local industry to make sure that we're developing a program from the ground up that, that, that will support our kids and support our community. So that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell, and I'll happy, be happy to answer questions that you have about it. Well, but I may not know all the answers yet. Well, I, I have just a, a couple of yes, uh, sir. questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
And uh, so, Mr. Horton, I very much appreciate your offer to talk with me about this earlier, but uh, given the fact that we had an ill pet, I, I wasn't I able to. But, but in any case, um, certainly the fact that the superintendent and yourself and his staff and uh, all the folks associated are bringing this forward uh, compels me to be very favorable because that tells me that you folks have looked at it and you believe this is something that's good for this school district. But I do have a couple of questions regarding commitments by the school district. Um, for example, what, what are we committed to do or is that something to yet be developed? And for example, um, are, are we committed to provide any deliverables uh, are, are we committed to having classes uh, or courses uh, with students? I, I was just curious about that. I, I, I scanned through the documents uh, last evening, um, but I wondered if, if you might speak to that or, or maybe I just missed it. So in, in, in all Triumph uh, Gulf Coast applications and analyses, deliverables are the key for the Triumph Group. And whether that is um, delivering industry certifications at the K-12 level or if uh, you're, or you're a, um, a county or a city government looking for Triumph funding, then your deliverables might be increased jobs um, in the community. And so they are looking at a metric that identifies a return on their investment. And so in this situation, our deliverables, deliverables would be 1,100 industry certifications over the next six years that um, are above and beyond what we would earn otherwise as a school district. So that, that is, that is um, in some levels, ambitious, uh, but I think it is something that we can accomplish. So, so to answer your first question, there are deliverables. One of the things that, and, and, and maybe getting to, to another question, um, the Triumph organization is, is very interested in their investments going and, and being successful. And so you may have heard in other situations where um, entities go down the road in a Triumph grant and then maybe are not able to attain those deliverables. And then what happens? Um, there's a term called clawback sometimes where the, the organization would, would take back funding. Um, what I, what I, what I am, am feeling positive about this particular application is if we create the classes and the curriculum like we plan to do with UF, they will fill up uh, and they will be funded internally just through the um, state FTE process. Um, what we want to be able to do is, is use those ESSER funds um, to jumpstart and then um, some of what you'll see is a lot of the funding from Triumph comes um, in the middle of the grant through earned certification. So when we produce earned certifications and then they pay us based on that, um, so it's kind of a produce then recover, recover funds. That's an excellent description. <clears throat> and, and I wondered if some of the teacher training, uh, and of course I'm speaking to, to Ms. Lightborn in, in one way, uh, and, and some of the curriculum development that I read about uh, in, in the grant, if, if that might in fact also be something that we, we might can use as a deliverable, uh, because I, I understand the commitment level. Yes, sir. Well, everything that we can identify as a deliverable, and then one of the things too is if, if approved, then this application will go to the Triumph organization for their review. Um, and in talking with those folks, Corey Henderson is the administrator over there, and uh, Dr. Fuller is the uh, educational expert, Frank Harper, excuse me. Uh, Fuller. Economic. No, no, the economic advisor, right. uh, Rick uh, Harper right. from UWF. Right. Um, if, their, if their board views this application favorably, then that begins the real negotiation and contract process. So okay. this board would see much more in terms of final deliverables and contracts prior to any funds changing hands. And so that, that's important for the board to know that, that well, this is a, it, it's, it's a broad application, um, but there's much more detail to be, to be determined once we, once we move past this initial and, part. And, and again, what gives me solace in, in this particular example is that this is something that you and the superintendent and his staff would, 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 would flesh out, so to speak. Yes, sir. And, and that you would be bringing that forward to us as something that you believe that, that we can accomplish. Yes, sir. I get it. Okay. Yes, sir. And I'd just like to say that I think it would be a great compliment to the K-12 
computer technology programs that we already have in place and the programming programs that we have in place. And uh, knowing that on the flip side of that, we have DARPA and Homeland Security and other agencies that are looking for graduates with this kind of capability. And just to bring one of your examples home even more closely, you talked about the telephone. I challenge everybody who doesn't realize that your phone listens to you to have conversation about something you're passionate about and have your phones nearby. Even if it's something like, I'm looking for child care, I'm looking for a new bassinet, or I'm looking for a Louis Vuitton handbag. And in moments, you will be flooded with ads for those very types of items. So your phones are already artificially intelligent. But I do think that would be a great compliment to programs we already have in place here, yes, certainly with the CTE programs. That well, I, I, I like that part of your vision. Thank you. Thank you. And I was watching a movie the other night. It's probably a 30-year-old movie. I won't say the name of it because that would be embarrassing. But um, in that movie, um, as people walk through a building, um, the advertisement that's on the walls adjusts to that person and maybe what that person's device is saying about them. And so it's, it's real-time advertising. And so that's, that is, that's where we'll be. And, so to your point. And I'll add, that's why de-Googled Googled phones are sold out. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's why I'm getting the advertisements for poppable device. potato chips, because I bought some. <laughs> uh -huh. so there you go. They can hear the sound of Blame you crunching them. <laughs> Never had an advertisement for it before, but now I've been getting them, so it makes sense. Following you in the first well, and I, I would just uh, comment, watching you. and I would just comment, as Dr. Kelly said, Mr. Chambers, uh, I know the theme is uh, the next generation of schools, and this is definitely something that is uh, putting us on track for our next generation of schools, so I'm really excited about the uh, opportunity that we're going to have to present this, and hopefully we'll be able to bring it forward. So. Yes, sir. Well, you'll get updates, and you'll you'll absolutely see more information and, and specifics as we go forward before we enter into any contractual agreements. Thank you, Mr. Horton, Mr. Chambers. Okay, so now we'll move to Section 8.2 uh, 28, Sale and Disposal of Surplus Property. 8.29, Subject Interinstitutional Early College uh, Dual Enrollment Articulation Agreement between the Okaloosa County School District and Northwest Florida State College for 2021 through 2022. I'd just like to make one comment, and I think Ms. Lightborn will appreciate that. As we go into these things, it's meaningful for parents to understand the highlights of them. And one highlight of this dual enrollment interinstitutional agreement is that we are so happy to provide these options for our students, but one of the key things here is that our students, we encourage them to participate, and certainly my own daughter was a participant, but to participate understanding that they can't participate until our school year ends. Thank you. Thank you, Sheila. All right. So uh, Section uh, 8.30, Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. Uh, ESSER II funding under the Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriation Act, uh, CRRSA Act, proposed expenditures for fiscal year 2021 through 2022. And if you go up there, the acronyms again uh, are there. So you heard ESSER funding and uh, CARES Acts and all that. So it's interesting to see where all this money is coming from. Uh, but when you hear those acronyms, this is what we're talking about where we're getting the funding for those programs. So 8.31 summer school programs for 2021, uh, SIS, ESY, summer, school, summer scholars and junior lifeguard program for credit. I have something about, about that. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, I think it's great, uh, Mr. Chambers, what you and your staff are doing about expanding the summer school program. I know that it's uh, normally we don't go, for example, to every elementary, but under the circumstances coming off the year that we have, I think it's justifiable. Um, I'd like to know, I, I just want to make sure that parents and others out there are aware of how much we're reaching out for this summer program. What is the plan to, um, quote, advertise or at least disseminate the information so that parents are aware of uh, this program and, and that it's going to be bigger than it has been in the past. No, absolutely. And I, I see out of my peripheral, this uh, <laughs> is, is stepping up. Okay. 
Thank you, Ms. Uh, Lightboard. You're welcome. So we are an elementary, uh, we are going back to hubs. Um, for oh. for many reasons, but oh, okay. uh, we are I thought going it was, back I'm to sorry, hubs. I thought it was going to each one. Okay, no, we were trying to. Okay. It, it was um, it would work out better if we're at hubs, okay. but we'll increase the size and, and um, obtain as many teachers as we possibly can. Remember that we will be looking at students first who meet retention criteria, and those students will be personally invited by the school. Then once we know what those numbers are, then we will look at serving students and and trying to close the gaps for for all students who um, would like to come to summer school so our first preference though is any student who would meet retention criteria and we have to figure out what those numbers are first okay all right but okay. still we want to make sure those parents are aware absolutely but yeah. they will get individualized sure. invites by yeah, the invites, school yeah mm -hmm. okay thank you appreciate yeah. that and I just have one more question. Uh, so the junior lifeguard program, is that something that we've offered every summer? Pretty yes, much? we except for last summer, unfortunately, right. because of COVID, but that has been something that we offer every summer, and that is in conjunction with the life, the Okaloosa County lifeguards. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a great opportunity for our kids. Oh, I've seen some kids that I had in elementary school who are doing mm -hmm. it now as high school students, and um, it's a great experience. Well, and again, the reason why I brought that up was just to show the connection that we have with the needs of the county or our community in offering these programs because we are right there on the ocean or Absolutely. the Gulf, I should say. Yeah. i got to remember we're not in the ocean, yeah. but, yeah. but uh, and the needs are out there for lifeguards. And, you know, so we do offer that program to help out there. So that's. Yes. Yeah. And I'm Absolutely. glad to see Summer Scholars back. That's a great yes, program. Yes, we're very excited about that. Stephanie got that together and, yeah. and um, we're moving forward with that. So we're very excited about yeah, that. It, it really good. went well the past few years. So. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All righty. So now we'll move down to <coughs> Section 9, Superintendent's Human Resource Recommendations. And the first two on Monday night will be for information only. So we have employees on administrative leave and 9.2 deferred retirement option program to drop. And 9.3 student in intervention services staffing pattern restructure. 9.4 employment separations. 9.5 personnel recommendations. I'll just add there that uh, Mr. Hale, Dr. Hale, it looks like we have seven more new substitutes added so i like the fact that we're seeing the growth in the number of substitutes because we know we're going to need a ton of them thank you and 9.6 employee transfers 9.7 reinstatement reimbursement of sick leave due to line of duty illness injury medical examination and 9.8 leave without pay Section 10 is a discussion agenda. At this time, there's nothing been moved from the consent agenda. So we'll move down to section 11, always our, one of our favorite sections. Mine so too. Dr. Kelly. Well, we will have our first meeting of April or, or our only meeting in April, Monday morning. So Monday night, I'll be able to give you a thorough report. All right. Thank you, Chairman. Always look forward to those. So uh, nothing on information, uh, technology seat management contract and Mr. McInnes, you're up, sir. One item, one item, Mr. Chairman, I need to ask the board to uh, schedule an attorney-client session to discuss pending litigation. Uh, this is in Okaloosa Circuit Case 2020 CA 001383F, and we would propose to schedule that uh, prior to the last board meeting in April, so at 5 o'clock on April 26th, uh, and if the chairman is okay scheduling that yes. then then Jan can move forward get right. that and done I think and we've already pretty much contacted everybody so I know I'm in agreement with them and as long yes. as everybody okay yes sir thank you all right okay anything else mr. McInnes no sir all right thank you sir so now mr. <coughs> Chambers you're up all right I appreciate it I, I want to start off by saying <clears throat> we are in a, a season a season of hiring right now and as you know we, we, we briefed the board on we have a number of retirements that are coming up uh, and we see uh, that occurring you know, right away with uh, the, the first two appointments that'll come uh, this, this upcoming Monday. So with each new hire, uh, there's a likelihood that there's a cause and effect relationship. So as someone fills a position, that means that vacated position is now going to be filled. So we will, you will see a number of um, positions that will come forward over the next uh, several board meetings. And uh, anytime that you have retirements or uh, 
um, I would say anytime you have reti retirement, so obviously there's going to be those individuals that are going to fill those spots. So just want to give you that information. We do have prepared just to give you, uh, I'd say, a good bit of information from different departments today. And we're going to have Dr. Hale come up and just share a little bit about um, the upcoming job fair. Then we're going to have Mr. Horton share a little bit of information as well as Ms. Lightborn. And then I'm going to wrap up um, some additional information as well. Dr. Hale. All right, thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody on this rainy day. I got here before the rain started, which was which was great because, you know, I have trouble with my hair on yeah. rain days. But um, <laughs> uh, Dr. Kelly, I wanted to start before just kind of addressing the sub uh, comment that you made. I do appreciate you noticing that. We've had a, a great several months of hiring subs. Uh, we actually went back and did a little research earlier this week. To we made a determination. We've had over 540 subs that have actually stepped up and great. taken jobs That's during great. just specifically mm -hmm. during the COVID time. So um, I think you've noticed on the board reports that the new hires, the biggest list has been subs. Um, so that's that's a credit to, to you all and the interventions that you made, but also I want to specifically give a shout out to Rachel Money, who is our sub person in HR. She has been grinding hard, um, and it's paying dividends. And we do uh, there's there's room for more. So um, I know that we like to speak to the public in this form, and so my my plea to the public would be substituting is a great job. Um, we take care of our subs here, and there's always a job available for you. So um, just like to throw that shout out. Mm -hmm. We are very busy in HR right now. As you know, we're getting ready for end of the year activities such as preparing for recommendations and completing evaluations and all those types of things. Um, and so one of the things that does occur as a result of all these processes is vacancies. Um, as you know, we have over 150 to 200 instructional hires that we do routinely every, every year. Um, as of this moment, and, and I can tell you that Ms. Wright, our retirement specialist, has had literally her dance card filled for the last two or three weeks but we have 50 known instructional retirements alone this year um, so we do know that there's going to continue to be uh, vacancies I know that if you look through the the board agenda and you looked over the SR2 uh, portion you see that there's also some remediation teachers that we're uh, hoping to uh, to fund with some of those relief funds uh, to kind of bridge the gap and, and and help some of these students along that have that have struggled a little bit um, so with all that being said, it is time to really put the, the recruitment efforts down. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our job there. I'd like to tell you a little bit about our recruitment efforts that we've been going through in HR to find uh, not just employees, but great employees. Um, and, and also kind of get you to promote a little bit our job there. Uh, I think it was interesting, you know, Dr. Kelly uh, and, and Mr. Bryant, you guys had your, your AI examples about, you know, speaking around your phone the other night. I was sitting there with my wife and I was watching a movie and a guy with a fedora came on and I thought, jokingly, I said to her, I think I look good in a fedora. And she didn't think so, but then immediately <laughs> when I went into Facebook, yeah. I was getting uh, advertisements for that. So my message <laughs> to you is, Human Resources has a Facebook page where we are promoting our virtual job fair. So the more you share, the more people's phones get those advertisements and things like that. So share our Facebook page. I know, Mr. Bryant, you always do that. Um, and also retweet our Twitter feed as well. Yeah, I was going to say, y'all have been very active on Twitter here lately. So just to retweet gets a gets more uh, views on it. I so. really do, And I do appreciate that. Now, our virtual job fair is next week. It's the 13th, 14th, and 15th. Um, there's room for more. So. The more you share, the more applicants we get. So we'll, we'll take advantage of, of that uh, artificial intelligence. Um, and our job fair was very, was very um, successful last year. It yielded a lot of good applicants for our principals. Basically, what we do with our job fair is we record live. The principals can participate uh, either live or through our um, recorded sessions that they have something that they can't participate in. And they can actively select. Uh, the positions that they are, are they're interested in because as you know um, we have specific difficult to fill positions which require a little more um, intensity by the pr principals we're specifically looking and again I'm going to keep promoting we're specifically looking for school psychologists occupational therapists guidance counselors all secondary math and science and anything related to ESE we are actively looking for applicants um, for this essentially 
pre-screening process. Um, what we do is we ask uh, just a series of questions in intervals to these applicants and what we do is we give the principals the ability to pre-vet based on uh, some of these commonly asked questions um, and we did vet the principals for some of these questions last year and it worked out well. So we, get it, we give them the, uh, the resumes ahead of time, we do a few of those uh, pre-questions that they like to ask, we put them on camera and then the principals are able to view those and make some decisions on who they want to literally ask to their building in interview. And it worked very well last year and we are hoping that it works uh, again at least that well and, and potentially better this year. Um, so that's coming up the 13th, 14th, and 15th, as I said. So that's our fair, but I also wanted you to know what Human Resources has been doing to recruit just beyond our fair. And it's kind of a daisy chain effect because all the things that we have participated in have brought candidates literally to our fair. So we're expecting to get uh, a little more uh, detailed with them uh, as the process goes. But just so that you know, we've already pr uh, participated in recruitment fairs this year at Troy. Um, Northwest Florida State College, UWF, we're participating with Florida State today, literally today, um, but we've also had a, a focus on uh, diversity recruitment. We've participated in several of the HBC's recruitment fairs, Alabama State, uh, FAMU, and for the first time, we were not able to do it last year, but we were registered, um, and this year we were actually able to participate in the Florida Fund for Minority Teachers Annual Teacher Recruitment and Professional Development Symposium, which is statewide, but I think it should be noted that we were a silver sponsor of that, um, and we actually did get some candidates for our job fair through those efforts. So we're very excited about the prospects of filling some of these potential vacancies. Uh, we, we are going to, as Mr. Horton has said before and Mr. Chambers has alluded to as well, we're going to continue our conservative approach to hiring, but we're going to go ahead and, and, and identify those candidates that are best for Okaloosa so we can get ahead of some of these other counties that sometimes pick our pockets. Um, in terms of our current fare, the slots are filling up fast. Elementary is very, very heavy, but again, we're still looking for secondary math and science, anything related to ESE and, and some of those other specialty um, positions that I mentioned earlier. So uh, any questions on any of the recruitment stuff? Well, I, I don't have a question, but I do have a comment. So we're mentioning about education, educational support, but we also need bus mechanics too. I noticed that's been. We do. Yeah. In fact, you know, our fair right now is focused on instructional, but we are developing plans for a summer ed support recruitment fair as well because we are always needing bus drivers. We're always needing custodials. Uh, we're always needing cleaning. And we have actually 55 ed support retirements planned for this mm -hmm. year too. So it's not going to, uh, it's not going to uh, be a non issue. We're going to continue to recruit in those right. areas as well. So. And those are just up-to-date numbers in terms of retirement, because like I said, Miss Miss Wright, her dance card is full for the next several months. I mean, 105, just 100, just mm -hmm. between teachers and support, that's mm -hmm. a huge number. Yes, and that kind of aligns with our typical 150 to 200 mm -hmm. that we deal with every mm -hmm. year. Uh, and yeah. just, I, I see Elena and Dr. White, I'm sorry, but I just got to give one shout out to the group over there in HR. Uh, they are prepared for this in terms of making this work. We've had a lot of system innovations over the last two years that have not only been able to leverage their talents over there, but also kind of create some system uh, efficiencies that make their jobs even easier. So I'm, I'm really proud of my group over there. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Dr. White, I'm sorry I had no, to say No, it's that. fine. I was <laughs> just waiting for, for an opportunity to ask the chairman uh, if I might. Uh, of course, of course. Um, so, so I really appreciate all the recruitment efforts that you're doing on Facebook and all those kinds of things. And, and you may already be doing this. I, I don't know, or maybe we don't need to do this. But are we doing, you know, in, in light of the fact that I, I think that Florida added about 500,000 new citizens last year, and it looks like we're adding a bunch of new folks this, this year. A lot of folks want to come to Florida for a lot of a lot of good reasons. <laughs> um, I, I'm wondering, are we doing any national advertising? Uh, are we there yet? So I can answer that question in a very kind of general sense. When we have a position that becomes Hard what I would call ultimately unfillable locally, right. we do use things like LinkedIn and okay. Indeed, which are nationwide, just depending yep. on people's um, searches that they do okay. individually on their end. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to. I'm not going to say we have anything beyond just those types of okay. message boards. Uh, the, 
we do participate in Handshake, which is what the colleges use for their job fairs. Okay. And I don't know exactly how far reaching that is. I would assume that's beyond just Florida. So we do use Indeed, LinkedIn when it's okay. appropriate, and of course, Handshake. Okay. And, and I know I've been following Governor DeSantis's remarks uh, pretty closely, and I'm sure board members have too. And, and you know, uh, I, I think I saw that uh, he called for some of the stimulus funds to be used as bonuses. Uh, for employees, uh, teachers and principals and, and other folks too. And, and so I'm wondering if uh, we ever get to the point or if it's permissible or even something that we ought or ought not to consider, uh, are there any kinds of incentives that uh, perhaps the stimulus dollars might can be used for to uh, maybe, maybe attract folks to kind of fill some of those, as you said, difficult to fill positions? Just a thought, uh, might not be appropriate, but uh, wanted to offer that. Interesting comments, and we, I'm very aware of uh, Governor DeSantis' uh, comments in the press, and trust me, my phone started ringing very, very quickly. <laughs> I'm and, and so <laughs> Ours too. <laughs> so, uh, and, and I do want to add one piece there. So on uh, the, the fact that the governor uh, is recognizing that this has been a very hard year for educators, uh, for administrators. I think all of us uh, really appreciate that. Um, I think we're looking to see exactly what the terms of um, instructional means, uh, principal means. But we have looked uh, just internally and said, um, if it strictly meant just teachers, if it strictly meant just principals, you know, who are other folks just in our school district as well? So we're looking at all of those numbers. Um, but we are very interested to see what the final outcome of um, who's defined within those categories and then we would uh, then be prepared if we were to move uh, in a direction um, as being one Okaloosa. And, and Superintendent and, and HR and Mr. Attorney, uh, I would hope that, that that might be something the governor accomplishes through his budget uh, <laughs> and through his legislation so that it's something that um, is defined uh, at his level since he's the one that's uh, uh, discussing these matters um, and, and certainly uh, I have to defer to the attorney regarding uh, any rules and regulations concerning collective bargaining and, and, and those kinds of things that we have to abide by. But if the governor does it and it becomes statute and legislation, well, just like everything else they pass along to us, we just have to do it. Yes, sir. I, that I is have a question. Right. Mm -hmm. um, remember, um, we've not really, or correct me if I'm wrong, have we gotten a directive from the, the governor and uh, Commissioner Corcoran about uh, going, eliminating, for example, my school online? Are we totally going back or do we not know yet? Because that might influence teachers' uh, positions as far as, I'm just, for example, I could think there might be um, a teacher who's working online and might not choose to come back and that might cause them to have to resign or make a change. Are we looking at those numbers to see as um, where we're looking at needing teachers and other individuals? I would say that the, the governor has or, and Mr. Corcoran have already determined that that MSO is not going to be funded next year. So okay. we have been working with the MSO teachers individually, and I don't have a round number of how that's going to ultimately impact our staffing. But there have been some in, some uh, case by case examples where we're talking through some things uh, with teachers, letting them know what their options are. Ultimately, uh, MSO teachers, brick and mortar teachers, are all part of our same recommendations plan, and so we're we're basically doing education um, emphasis to let them know what's coming so that they can make their own intelligent decisions on that. But the bottom line is the MSO is, as of right now, as far as we know, okay, the, the word is okay. that it's not going to be funded. So you've already asked those teachers if they're planning to come back into the classroom? Yes, ma'am. What we have done, and we've done this uh, on several occasions, is we've mentioned to the MSO teachers to work with their building level principals to give mm -hmm. us that information. And so those conversations are happening, and those are what typically spur the calls to HR saying, this is what I'm facing, what are my options? And so okay. we are then able to guide them either through retirement or, or through their principal with accommodations or, or whatever the conversation mm -hmm. is. Right. Because um, each one of them, you'd be, you would not be surprised to know that each one of them is unique. Um, sure. However, um, the plan remains to go back to school. 
And okay. so we have to we have to take each individual employee case by case and let them know exactly what they're looking at. Okay, good. Thank you. That's good information. Yeah. I, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, yeah, I wasn't quite up on that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And Thank since you. we brought up, I was going to save it to the end, but we were bringing up about the bonuses for our, our teachers and, and trying to figure out who and all of this. And I know there was some talk about our ed support, um, whether they were going to receive anything or not. I just want to say that I believe in teamwork and I believe that it takes everybody working together and our ed support are so very valuable. And being on the committee that selected our top, our selected our ed support of the year, of the 50-something applicants that, are, that were submitted from their schools, the number of uh, individuals that were custodians that were recognized by their school for the job above and beyond. And our, of our top three employees that were recognized, the two of those were custodians. And I don't know that, I haven't been on the committee long, but I've watched it, that we've ever had that many um, recognized. And so if there was any way, uh, any power that can put a bug in the governor's ear maybe to do a, you know something to recognize our ed support individuals because they you know especially our custodians and have done above and beyond this year and I think they all should be recognized personal mm -hmm. the personal point but well I think you'll find a lot of agreed. agreement right yeah, here agreed. On, on this board on this board and right. and uh, I know and Ms. Scallon can can correct me if I'm wrong that in the past when we've been given legislation that provided you know certain things for certain people um, this school board uh, under the superintendent's recommendation has has gone forward and funded other uh, other folks that might have been left out mm -hmm. and uh, i'm hoping that that's something that again that again might occur mm -hmm. and i appreciate i appreciate the spirited uh discussion about this because we we you know we all focus on doing the right thing but like dr white said it's just the governor's recommendation right now so none yeah. of this is no, it's just it's happening but uh you know but I, I truly appreciate the spirit of discussion on how all of our team members are important so and, and i want to reiterate uh playing off of what you just said mr bryant so this is a recommendation from the governor right now so we're still waiting on exactly who is defined within those categories but then going off what mrs gardner said and what dr white um, agreed with so we have already uh, pulled the exact number of our educational support employees we've pulled the exact number of employees that aren't always categorized in the instructional mm -hmm. piece we've pulled the number of uh, administrators outside of principals we've pulled the numbers of those um, at the district staff and it goes back to what I was talking about about the one Okaloosa everybody um, this year um, it's been tough everybody this year it's been tough everybody is pulled together um, from bus drivers to custodians to teachers to administrators HR um, up at MIS everybody is pulled together um, so if there was a bonus that was um, to be uh, played out we would see exactly what the governor's uh, defined roles are for that and we would appreciate that we also then would have the ability um, and we're still looking into that because he would be utilizing um, our understanding ESSER funds. So then we would also look at um, some ESSER funds as well. And of course with board approval and, and talking with you all as well, how we might um, do the same for our people. Bottom line is we, we want to take care of all of our people because everyone has helped us get through this year. Right. And I and appreciate that's so always been your message and you've always, always stand behind that. So thank, thank, you. thank you for already being on top of it. And, and I just add, if I might, that when I heard the governor speak about this, it, it was in reference to what exactly the superintendent said, that you know Florida was, was one of the only schools, districts statewide that was opened mm -hmm. uh, for a period of time in the pandemic and, and has remained open. And the governor spoke at length about the fact that, that, that these employees, and I'll use that in a broad term, went far beyond the call of duty in keeping our schools open during the pandemic and that's why he believes a bonus is in order and and I just wanted to make sure the public understood that that's why because right. these folks went well beyond the call of duty and well beyond uh, particularly often in the case of non-instructional employees right. beyond their job descriptions 
And, and I think that's what the governor was trying to recognize, is the fact that during the pandemic, during all of this time when illness was so rampant, that, that our folks stayed on duty. And there's some schools that still are just now. Oh, opening. yeah. Right. Uh, so yes, ma'am. I think Flor Florida was one of two states that actually mm -hmm. has open. been open the whole time. So. Our employees. All right. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Thank Hale. You. Mr. Horton. I'll be very brief. I know the superintendent have comments to follow. Um, just following up on career technical education, so Ms. Lightborn is going to come up and speak about uh, statewide testing underway, FSA, and of course exams. But there's another round of testing that's going on that is equally important and in some, some ways more important to our students, and that's the testing for industry certifications. So whether it be cybersecurity or engineering or, or automotive, culinary, um, construction, there are certifications out there that kids uh, test on, students test on at both the middle and high school levels that give them recognized credentials as they go out into the workforce. So that's happening this spring. Some of our students, um, you know, there's not a calendar for testing like there are for statewide assessments because sometimes students test as they're ready and they move on to the next issue. So it's been going on this spring, but I know we're getting into certification testing season as well. So I wanted to just make sure the board was aware of that and understood we wish those students well and thank those teachers for the job they're doing. And, and that's really all I have. If I'm not mistaken, Mr. Horton, some of those count as a portion of our school grades. So they, they are they, intricately important. And we exact. even had one of our schools that obtained an A due to that segment on the school grading formula. It's, a, it's a, at the middle school level, it's acceleration component. Mm -hmm. and at the high school level, it's college and career acceleration. And it is can have a significant impact on school grades. So, so very exactly important. Right. And Thank you. keep in mind, last year we, we uh, left in March, and so many of the certification exams, we, we worked and did the best we could, um, were not able to be completed. So uh, we're happy to be back in the building this year and, and, and ramp those back up again. But good point, Thank Dr. You. Kelly. You're right. That's all I've got. Thank you. Right. And as Ms. Lighthorn comes forward, I also want to um, just share with Dr. White and the board had also asked about a CTE, a career and technical education one pager. So uh, where we're about to the finalization of that, as you can imagine, the, the aesthetics of that is uh, something that kind of goes in debate sometimes. So I think we're at a point where it's almost um, done. I'm gonna have Mr. Horton uh, kind of get with you, Dr. White, and just uh, kind of look at that. We'll get that to the board if you have any input as well. But this will be a document that'll help you uh, in any conversations that, that you might have as it pertains to CTE. Uh, it'll give you some um, nice information, but also, and, and just as importantly, it's gonna give great information um, just to our schools, to our families, and to the community as well. So a lot of good things happening with CTE and a lot of um, future plans with CTE as well. So I appreciate that suggestion. Okay. Well, I'll and I appreciate the fact that uh, you know, speaking of social media, uh, Ms. Branscombe and her team have definitely ramped it up to highlight all the great things that are going on in, in the school districts so, uh, regarding CTE. So that's exciting to see what's going on. So, Ms. Lightboard? Okay. I, I wanted to give you kind of an update on where we are testing, where we are moving forward for next year, um, and all the things that are coming. So we are in testing season. We started uh, the writing, ELA writing, this week. So um, we have begun. I wanted everybody to understand how long our testing season goes. So uh -huh. elementary ends May 14th, middle school ends May 28th, and high school ends June 9th. So that kind of gives you a perspective of the amount of time um, that we will be testing within our schools. So that has all begun. Our schools all have an MSO testing plan. So for students who are either MSO, homeschooled, Florida virtual, all of the things that where students have not been in our buildings, they fall into this plan. This plan allows students to come into our buildings and test in separate locations. Each school has their own plan. Some have done uh, odd hours, some have done odd days, um, and some have uh, made an, a exterior entrance the entrance that they come into so they don't have to come through the entire building during a regular school day so there's just a variety of plans the MSO parents have been notified of those plans um, so those are also in play and have begun um, this week as well 
Okay, so that was my update on testing. I, Ms. Vancheck, you look like you had a question. No, no, I'm good. Okay, <laughs> all right. I'll just make a statement, Sheila, just sure. for the point. Mm -hmm. If ever you wanted to be in awe of a K-12 principal, yeah. just acknowledge the fact that they deal with three different pupil progression plans, three different mm -hmm. discipline plans, in many cases, three different levels of authorization of use for different data mm -hmm. uh, material, and certainly three different testing windows. Yes. Unbelievable. Yes. So yes. K-12. And, and on, on top of that, uh, at the high school level, we have SAT school day on April 13th. That's also an FSA testing day as well. Um, there's AP and IB exams, ACE exams. So um, you guys know it, it, it will be a very busy time from now till the end of the year with testing. But, well, you so, know, one comment though real quick is absolutely. that this is, uh, it's good to hear all this because this kind of is a normal thing for know. us, you know? <laughs> right? So to hear all this testing going on, so that brings back some, right some normalcy there so correct correct yeah, and i think i saw that one school was doing their testing off campus for usually for ap and ib they do okay. so all i think all of our schools we use the fairgrounds some use i think niceville might use cross point, cross point. so well, we do that yeah, that's on that was actually on yeah 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 they're finding yeah thinking out of the box there right? <laughs> yes Fine yes it also Maybe helps um, alleviate disruption during that testing time. So the other thing that I wanted everyone to be aware of is there are new standards coming. They're called the best standards. And we will be implementing K-2 ELA next school year. So our coaches and our um, district specialists have been trained recently, probably within the last week. Um, and they are creating professional development opportunities for teachers. We're trying to be a little bit creative, offer some for payment. Um, evenings and Saturdays we'll be offering this summer. will be a very, very, very busy summer um, providing that type of PD as well with a big emphasis on K-2. But in the middle of this, we are in the middle of a textbook adoption. So it's a very interesting textbook adoption for ELA. So we're adopting K-12 ELA. Our K-2 go to best standards next year, but our 312 do not. But the textbooks will, are written to best standards. So we have currently been creating a crosswalk so that if you're teaching through this textbook, you also know what standards from the Florida standards still need to be covered that aren't part of the best standards. So ELA is going to be very, very, very busy over the summer and next year, um, getting through this year of transition. Also the following year, so next year we do K2 ELA, best standards. The year after, so 22-23, we do 312 ELA best standards and K-12 math best standards. That is also the year we do K-12 um, textbook adoption for math. May I ask a question? Of course. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Ms. Lightborn, is it all right at this point? Uh, absolutely. Um, having had to deal with those kinds of things before and, and understanding that the funds provided by the state for textbook purchases are minimal, to say, to say the least. Um, do we know or is it possible to use any of the stimulus funds for these adoptions, particularly with uh, <laughs> the, uh, the, the new standards that we're going to be implementing? Yes, sir. That we are, we are um, currently asking for permission oh, to do that. Great. I think some of that is in ESSER 2 that that'd you just saw. So to support, we would currently spend what our normal allotment yes, is right. um, in textbooks on the textbooks, but then anything above oh. and beyond that, we would be looking that at be trying to get some help. If, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. And specifically to oh, your yeah. point, Dr. White, <clears throat> we receive approximately you can correct me if I'm wrong, Rita, about <laughs> $1.7 million for our textbook uh, adoption process. Each this, year. This ELA adoption will be over $5 million. There you go. See? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we have so put forward. about $3.4 million yeah. in the request for the ESSER dollars. Right. And, and, I, and, I'll, and, and you all know <clears throat> this. I hope you haven't had to do it. But, but try to explain to a parent why their child doesn't have a textbook. I mean, it's, just, it's, it's a no-go. Right. And mm -hmm. so... And so uh, this this would be great if you guys can can make that happen. 
We are trying. All right. We good. are trying. Currently Excellent. trying. So, Miss Lightborn, as we're moving forward, uh, BEST is obviously an acronym, correct? Yes. Can you please uh, tell us what BEST is? <laughs> because we're obviously going to be using that a lot here in the next few years. Let, let me get, get back, with back to you on that one. I, I, I know there well, are I've the been, new I've been racking in my head I, I, trying yeah, to figure out. I, right now, it's just well, not quite can, there, benchmarks, girls. Benchmarks for Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Horton. And you can tell it's us. It's not <laughs> something you would think. But, but you can tell us what it is. It's a replacement, right? Absolutely. Right. It is a replacement of our Florida standards with the with new standards. Um, and so that is the, the ELA K2 this coming year and then 312 the following year and math follows that science is not currently part of that so we won't be doing that but the um, social studies is also not part of it so right. it's just our math and our ELA but that's a, it's always a big change right. um, standards and things that we currently teach maybe in one year are not going to be there and they'll be in a different year so there's a lot of adjustment that our teachers have to make in their instruction and that's why a lot of professional development Will, right. will be occurring from this right. and, and, and I can say uh, something that uh, well I was going to say thank you for oh, yeah, clarifying sure. that we were changing a from one standard to another that's why I asked what so Sorry. parents would get used to knowing what best what we were talking that's about right. best that's right we need to do that yeah. and and yeah. the the other part of that history oh, the best, the best, best test. test and we'll have the best <laughs> test yeah we'll have the best I think test. I remember that this came from Governor DeSantis's administration to move yes. away from the Florida standards that were loosely uh, aligned, and I'll use that word generously, loosely aligned with the old Common Core standards. Right. So, so this is an effort of the new administration to move us in a, in a, in a different direction, and, and hopefully the parents and the citizens and the students will be, will be happy with that. And I'd just like to say, ahead of the game in advance, I know that these are difficult transitional times anytime you go through a change in standards because we've invested an enormous amount of time, training, and money to get our staffs up to date on the standards we are leaving. But the encouraging thing is we can recall going to <laughs> Terra Nova, CTBS, Florida State Standards, mm -hmm. Common Core, away from Common Core, Florida Core, Next Generation, and yep. our teachers have always stepped up to the bat. So it's so encouraging to know that they will and to recognize that once you have new standards in place and all the training and all the support that goes into those standards, then what comes next? New assessments. Correct. And what's after that? New ways of dealing with the students who don't meet the benchmarks. So we know that we're prepared for all of these phases because we've always done it and we've always stepped it to the bat. So I'm very encouraged that we will handle this in the same manner. Absolutely. Are you, uh, you brought up assessment. So do you have any statement on that or do you know anything yet? Because obviously they start moving away from FSA and then we'll go to whatever they're going to call this new test. The best test. The best, the best <laughs> test. <laughs> Once we get um, to that, we don't ever have to do it again, sure right? So the best test. So the name one of those congressional uh, laws is exactly the opposite Lots of, of what jokes it says. about that. Right. So <laughs> I see do you are, have you already gotten some preliminary things on how that's going to? So we do have item specifications mm -hmm. on, on the best test. Um, so our, our specialists are looking through those now. Um, that will be part of the training because we always look at that in the AL that come along with that um, the test so even though our K2 starts best next year um, the test for 3-5 next year will still be Florida standards which is why we need that crosswalk mm -hmm. if they're using a textbook mm -hmm. that's aligned mm -hmm. to best they need to be able to still be able to test on the Florida mm -hmm. standards so that's our, yeah. our our I remember when we went funky. from FCAT <laughs> to FSA and you had this group on the FCAT and it's it's, it's a lot the other thing is that um, I see coming through is uh, the civics piece that's being added, and it, it's not just in social studies, it's in ELA. ELA. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's been incorporated <coughs> yet in the best standards because they haven't totally approved that yet. That's coming through the legislature, but um, they're going to start trying to get that in there as well. And I don't know what the requirements will be with ELA, but that's another thing that the... Um, uh, we've also, um, this during this season of grants that came from the state, there was a grant specific to civics reading for ELA. Right. And Ann Flanagan has ordered those books for our schools, so mm -hmm. there will be materials for schools to use in that avenue. So, yeah. We're and, then, and then you'll start to see what the test items would look like 
in that topic. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. Big transition. Big. Yes. All right. The best transition. <laughs> and there's a lot of comfort knowing um, I've worked with you. I know your department. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kelly, you mentioned that the knowledge that our K through 12 principals need, and that your knowledge of and you work with pre-K through 12. Yeah. And our teachers can find comfort in knowing that your department. I know that information the manuals the curriculum guides everything so there is a lot of support i know coming from your department thank you thank you, uh, you my girls are working hard and, and you do too uh, yeah, exactly. thank you thank you we're, yeah, we're trying because <laughs> sheila you and i go back we got a lot of letters the hsct ssat <laughs> yes. fcat da, da, da. Yes. the more letters you have the longer you've been doing this and i know you have those too so yes, thank you so much i did want to um inform you of one other thing so it is mr chambers knows it is my passion um after looking at our Flickr scores to get more vpk into especially our title one schools you're talking my language so right i know yeah, i know yeah. um and so we are currently opening four new vpks um mary esther walker bob sykes and Longwood so that's I'm really excited about that um, I'd like to see that happen at every title one school and potentially more in the future but it's a it's a fine line of balancing financially so that it it's not a, um, a cost prohibited program because it can be so we're working on that but that is also a, a big part of my passion is to get our babies ready because that's what we saw in some of our title one schools when you see their flicker scores less than 50 percent of them are coming in ready for kindergarten and so um, having more opportunity within the community within the school that those students will attend is what we need so we're working on that as well that's yeah, great it begins awesome. with early learning so yeah. thank you Good mr stuff. chambers and i were talking about that and um that's why i mentioned earlier the bp bb yeah. through 12. yes and that's, that's awesome where it begins Right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lightborn. All right. Well, I was going to, I was just oh, going to say, <laughs> and I can't help it because, because our, you, you use the money word in, in the VPK programs. And, 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 and I think it's important what you said that, that the public understand that, that that's a function of cost analysis mm -hmm. is do those programs generate enough funds through student enrollment to pay for themselves? Uh, because the, the school board, we, we can't pay for everything. And uh, that, that's huge to know. Uh, and and I, I guess your analysis tells us that in those four new sites, there will be enough students projected that they will self-fund themselves. One, one to 11 is what okay. we're able to do um, right. to make it self-funded, yes. There you go. And right. then Title I does pay uh, for a longer day for those students so that Excellent. they can stay Longer. pretty much as sure. full school day. Like with other kids, mm -hmm. right. Excellent. Yeah. All right. And there's Thank always you. a waiting list for those. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Ms. Lightboard. Mr. Chamber. All right. And I'll kind of wrap up, but I, I do want to uh, even kind of summarize Ms. Lightborn's piece. So you, you, you heard everything that's coming down the pike. And like she and I have talked about, uh, this, this is a monumental task for this upcoming school year, coming off of a pandemic with standards, textbooks, new assessments, people coming back to the building. So there's a lot that's going to be going on on the professional development um, that's needed to make sure that uh, everyone's on the same page will also be monumental. I've also talked with uh, groups of teachers about this via Zoom, uh, just so we're all on the same page. But uh, the piece that I appreciate in Ms. Gardner that you pointed out as well, um, the curriculum department, um, they are a hard working, smart group, but they also uh, reach out to principals. They also reach out to teachers um, in the classroom to make sure that we're getting input uh, from them so it's truly a team effort. So I do appreciate everything that, that we're doing there. I do want to remind the board that we, uh, uh, you guys approved, which I appreciate, that bus bulletin. Uh, so we have about a thousand folks uh, that have signed up for the bus bulletin. So anything that we can even do to continue to, to get that word out, and we're doing that also through the schools, we'd like to see 10,000 um, on there. But the neat thing, again, is that this bus bulletin uh, uh, notifies families if there's traffic or if we're running behind. So if we're running behind, they'll get a text that in essence says uh, your child's bus is, is running 10 minutes later, 15 minutes late, so families aren't uh, worried. 
Uh, many of you um, up here have received phone calls from parents saying, you know, my child has not gotten off the bus yet. For a parent, um, that's not a fun, it's not a fun feeling. So we're excited to bring that as an addition to transportation. Jay McGinnis did a great job uh, finding um, this app. He always, he's very proactive, so we, we, we appreciate that. Also, you may know, um, April's a very, very busy month. Uh, there's several uh, different uh, categorizations for different um, folks to honor. Uh, first and foremost, uh, it's Autism Month. Um, and we've put things out to the schools. Our schools are, are honoring this. You may see some things on social media as well. Uh, I had the opportunity to read a, read a book uh, to elementary students uh, via recording and get that out as well. So this is a month that we definitely want to honor and celebrate. Um, our students uh, with autism, as you know, they're, they're right in our schools. They, they do a great um, job, teachers working with those students as well. Um, so very proud, very proud of the students. Also, it's uh, Military Appreciation Month as well, and, and some of you may have some words um, that is additionally. Uh, we are at a high military community, and I think uh, all of us agree that uh, we wouldn't be the, the school district we are without our military families. I know growing up in a military family, um, what, what's that like, and especially to move several times when you're engaged in one area, you have to go to a new area and sit down at lunch. I used to dread that, um, but we're so appreciative to our military families. And then this week is also Assistant Principal Week, and um, many of us know that our assistant principals are some of the hardest working individuals behind the scenes who do... Um, a whole lot of work and sometimes that's not necessarily known mm -hmm. to others but it's definitely known to that principal and we are in great shape here in Okaloosa County in terms of future leaders so I just couldn't be uh, more proud of our assistant principals just giving you a, a quick uh, snippet of an update on on COVID I think you've seen the the information coming to us each day uh, whereas, like we've talked in the past, it used to be 20 cases, 16 cases, 22 cases. The last uh, number of days, and actually almost about uh, the last few weeks, you know, three cases, in many cases, zero, zero. Um, cases. Yes. Just a little bit of data. Again, if we'd love to have zero across the board. Uh, for the week um, ending March 27th, of our 38 sites, um, we had zero cases amongst uh, students and staff. Uh, so that's, so excuse me, 30 of our 38 sites had zero cases for students and staff. So 30 of 38, that, that's, that's, pretty, um, that's pretty good. Of the remaining eight sites, uh, none of those had more than two total cases. So again, we'd love to have zero across the board and just being just very, very matter of fact uh, with the data. Still to date, um, and we've been doing this for a while, still to date, approximately 96% of our students um, have not been positive. Uh, so just very much appreciate the work that our schools have done. And again, it goes back to our conversation earlier. It takes everybody uh, working together to, to have a successful school year. I also want to just give you a little bit of information <clears throat> on the vaccine clinics. Niceville High School is still a vaccine um, clinic. So we're very happy to continue to work with our health department. I believe the shot that they're utilizing there is the Pfizer shot, Pfizer shot so two shots. Um, so the clinics are open from 3 to 7.30 each day that they're open. April 14th and May 5th uh, are dates where they can do the two shots on those dates. April 26th and May 17th, those go in tandem for the two shots. And then May 6th and May 27th as well. We also have um, some groups that are reaching out to us, uh, some pharmacies that want to be able to come to the schools. So Ms. Schroeder is, uh, we're trying to get in contact with um, a particular uh, uh, pharmacy that would be working with the health department to be able to provide more opportunities for those who want to get vaccinated. So just trying to give our employees every opportunity to get vaccinated. And of course, there's other areas as well outside of what we're doing, of course. Um, Again, just appreciate uh, the board. There's no way that we could do this without you all. I do appreciate the phone calls. I do appreciate um, the input that you all provide. And working together has helped us uh, get to where we are today. 
And of course, now we have to concentrate our continued efforts on finishing this year strong for our students and employees. So Mr. Chambers, real quick, uh, I noticed that you have several staff members here today and uh, we appreciate y'all being here. Uh, first of all, Ms. Schroeder, it's good to see you back there. I know you had uh, some surgery and you've been out the last couple of weeks, even though you told me you've been working from home. Uh, but uh, thank Ms. Davis for uh, keeping us up to date while you were gone. I know she went above and beyond to keep us informed. And earlier we were talking about security and being uh, possibly hacked and having a ransom held over our head. And I think in uh, Broward County, you know, they offered 500,000, but I think it's in the millions is what they're really wanting. And uh, Mr. Frakes is here right now. And uh, Russ, I hate to put you on the spot, but we work together with Fizbit. So would you mind coming up real quick and just explaining if we were by chance to have to have to have a ransom over our head, how would that be? Uh, are we protected? Yes. yes, we have a cyber insurance policy in place uh, through Beasley uh, that they they plan for just that event. Right. Um, they have, uh, and it doesn't matter. They, they we meet with them frequently, and and they say it doesn't matter the level of the event. They want to be noticed of it, right. and they want to support the school district, and and uh, they act quickly. They have attorneys that are set up to do everything from. Uh, the actual negotiations of whatever, if there is a ransom ransom event that takes place, to communication, uh, what goes on with the what from a PR standpoint, what's shared, what the information that's shared with the public, uh, really handle that that operation uh, thoroughly and work closely with uh, our IT professionals, Eric and his staff, uh, so to make sure that uh, we're able to respond to that event and we're not alone. We are, we have the backing of that policy, and it's becoming. Uh, we're, we're in the process of renewing that coverage now, and it's uh, the questions that are being asked now where that policy was simply renewed with a one or two page application uh, fairly offhandedly. Right. It's now they, the underwriters are asking some very in depth questions, uh, as you can imagine, because of the prevalence of these types Planes. of gangs that are out there right. that are operating uh, on foreign soil typically that uh, we right. don't have the ability to reach out to and enforce right. anything on, but uh, we are certainly. Uh, our municipalities are primary targets of those, we, as we've seen in the news, uh, most recently with the Broward case. Well, um, I appreciate, Mr. Frank, you and Mr. Bryant, you, you bringing that to our attention right. because that's huge. And, and, you know, Broward, I mean, is not the only one right. you know, government agency. I mean, sure. just recently, uh, the city of Pensacola. Pensacola. Right. right. Wakulla well, County had one recently yeah. in the past right. year, so that didn't, didn't go very well. No. Um, well and certainly they would have benefited from some more right. handling yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I'm grateful and mr. Bryant I'll just share real quickly that uh, on information security magazine they just published an extensive article yesterday about the Broward situation right. and uh, mm -hmm. you may you might pull that up and take a look at right. it and mr. Frakes thanks you thank you for doing that sure. and right. uh, you guys well, answer all those questions yeah, just like they absolutely. need absolutely it's with the support of a lot of folks in the background to, to pull yeah. something like that off. well and, and again I didn't realize you were going to be here but we are actually meeting with Fizbit next week at uh, one of our quarterly meetings That's and correct. I just wanted everybody especially the board right. to know uh, how serious Fizbit yeah. takes Good. that I mean we have a dedicated session where we talk about cybersecurity and uh, uh, they they are working diligently to protect their members uh, uh, you know and working across the board to try yes. to make sure that if it does happen that we're prepared for it that's so. right that is correct a lot goes into that yeah thank you all right thank you mr frakes and mr bryant and mr frakes uh so you, you, you helped jog my memory. Okay. And uh, <laughs> Mrs. Vancheck asked a great question at the last uh, meeting and asked for some information um, on insurance. Um, and and we, so we promised to make sure that we had Mr. Frakes here to be able to give you, uh, you know, a brief uh, information on what was discussed. So uh, we have him here today. Uh, I was to hoping that. that was coming up, yeah, but yeah, I didn't want to be presumptuous. Why, and, <laughs> yes. and, and, Dr. Uh, Hale was over there looking at me saying, uh, so. <laughs> yeah, I thought. <laughs> well, and I noticed Russ was just do. kind of like at the edge of his seat. <laughs> so that, well, I thought I coming, uh, Mr. I, I Frakes was just thought he didn't have anything to do this morning. <laughs> yes. He'd come to a board Hang meeting. Out. Hang uh, out with workshop. you folks. Yes, absolutely. But, I'm happy uh, to be here. But thank uh, you, sir, for being here, yes. and I'm eager to hear what yes, you have to say. Well, I just wanted to update you. I know there was some question on a re at a recent meeting about the benefits program and what we're doing. Of course, as you recall, we brought a renewal to the board last year, and which was approved. Um, and you know, our medical insurance is, of course, one of those primary drivers, the biggest component of our of our benefits package, of course. Uh, 
and it's become a tremendous expense. Um, so the question is, you know, what are we doing? What what things? What options are available to the district um, as it pertains to being able to control those costs and and have still offer a very rich package of benefits, which ours is extremely rich. Um, and it, it's it's again, it's become expensive. So how, what what measures are available to us to control that? So I've met with the risk management staff has met with several industry experts, uh, brokers, consultants, other risk managers to find out just what are they doing, what are they seeing, and to vet information that can be shared with our benefits oversight group. The benefits oversight group, of course, as the board recalls, um, just for the benefit of everyone else, um, is com comprised of individuals, representatives from, the, from both unions and of the school district that is convened to consider options, making changes, renewing our benefits, our employee benefits uh, program. Um, they have met with, and we are meeting more frequently now with our benefits oversight group and our brokers, FBMC Consulting out of Tallahassee, uh, to consider what, our, what those options may be upcoming. Um, so uh, uh, we've met with their, they've, actually FBMC has provided us with what they call their healthcare innovations manager, and he's provided us with a series of educational meetings to, to explore uh, different elements of, uh, of employee benefits, specifically with the group medical coverage and alternative funding arrangements that might be available uh, to the district. Uh, so we've, we've gone through that. We're going to continue sifting through. It's a, a lot of complex information uh, and, and decide just what, what it is that uh, makes sense for the school district. Uh, the Benefits Oversight Group has done an excellent job over the course of their existence uh, to take measured and deliberate action when it comes to our benefits program. Um, make sure that uh, whatever whatever is pursued is something that's going to provide us with the best opportunity for for a good outcome for both the employees and the school district so uh, i know that that we'll continue to do that uh, the timeline at this point is uncertain uh, it may be something that that is um, you know could be there's certainly we have different perspectives on that is there something that you could do immediately uh, or is there a multi-year uh, strategy that would be in place so um, no decisions have been made at this point but again all options are being considered. Uh, we will also meet with United Healthcare um, here very very soon. Uh, they will have some uh, some alternatives present to the benefits of, to the bog as well um, that may enable us to uh, explore some ability to save some money as, uh, in some 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 of their proposals. So um, maybe adding additional lines of coverage. Uh, we'll see what they have to say. But again, that's um, just part of. Uh, one component of, of the um, alternatives that are being considered by the BOG at this point. And I appreciate the committee and what you do. Yes. Um, insurance is, in fact, the, the night that I requested this, we ended up in kind of an impromptu longer discussion than I had uh, wanted to, uh, to start. But it, it is one of those topics that does seem to draw a lot of comments and questions. I would like to ask you, when you came, um, I believe it was September, and put that yes, before last year. Um, you brought up a couple of things that um, on, on the side of employees that was causing that cost to go up. And it had to do with, um, first of all, overall utilization, but uh, employees going to an emergency room for perhaps medical need that was not true emergency. And mm -hmm. with, um, COVID, and that was all based on a previous year prior to right. COVID. I want to know with the COVID situation, um, I'm assuming you get reports on those kinds of things, and where, has that seemed to taper down? Has that, that helped? We will have, a, uh, we have an upcoming meeting uh, that will take place, I believe, and we're trying to get a, a date in May that where United Healthcare will come in and do a big meeting, and some of that will take place um, via Zoom, I'm sure this year mm -hmm. they have a uh, they have a doctor on staff. They have multiple doctors on staff, of right. course, but one that that reviews our our group's information, the data analytics that take place on the back end, um, that will address that issue among among many others. Uh, that's typically an hour and a half, two hour long meeting that we have with United Healthcare annually, uh, where that's that topic exact that topic specifically will be addressed. Uh, so we'll see where that where we're updated on that. Um, where we stand on that now, what what impact maybe COVID um, had on that? Um, you know, there there are many factors that go into it. Locally for us, um, you know, just the availability of doctors in our area, um, you know, just the the um, attitude that um, that many people many people have regarding the level of care that they receive at a at a um, 
minute clinic or um, uh, urgent care facility versus an ER. Maybe they feel that there's a better level of care that they're going to receive there when maybe the appropriate level uh, would be from a cost standpoint going to that urgent clinic, mm -hmm. uh, urgent care clinic, I should say. Um, and those things, and getting that information out to them, engaging our employees on that is, is what, it, what it will take to turn that around. So uh, those are all certainly things that will you know, be considered and try to, and also, try to make um, some headway there. Have you made, um, or what kinds of efforts have you made? Because one of it was uh, basically educating our employees on mm -hmm. steps they could take uh, to help their own health or certain mm -hmm. things so that maybe the claims wouldn't be so high. Is that still ongoing? Yes, to that's ongoing, and we're, we're getting a, a tremendous amount of information from uh, United Healthcare. Uh, we have um, an on site representative. Um, United Healthcare is still. They're still not in office. Um, they're not doing in-person meetings at this point, but she is still still there and available. She works on Kayla, and I'm speaking of Kayla Martin. Uh, and is she, she is, the lady who available. came that night or uh, that she, day? No, that that was not Kayla. Uh, okay. She is a she's a United Healthcare employee. Okay, gotcha. That is, she works three days a week to assist district employees with claims problems that they may have. But she's also gotten involved in because she's she's very interested in the wellness aspect of it as well as. Uh, communication strategies and things that, that, that can be done, just as you're saying, to help um, control costs uh, by empl based in the, uh, incentivizing employee behaviors is what we're talking about. And Ms. Ivanchek, um, to, also to your, to your question, as Mr. Uh, Bryant has discussed, so we now, um, so we have a monthly meeting uh, where we're going over insurance and one of the things that we looked at in our most recent meetings are all the types of trainings that we can put out to our employees to get those, um, to make sure that we get that information out. If we get that information out, then some of our claims can go um, down as well. So Mr. Frakes is right now in the process of, we've gone through, we've looked at all the different categories. So he and Dr. Hale are putting together a, a plan, in essence, a professional development plan, so to speak, for next year for our employees. So we can systematically get those trainings out to our employees I think uh, the most recent this year, I think of the of the districts, so I think we've fared well with the number of trainings, but we want yes. to get that up. Correct, absolutely. Also, um, we've utilized uh, the WAVE newsletter to put that information out as well. So uh, I think that's being, uh, getting some circulation there and enables us one more channel to be able sure. to communicate with employees, get information out that's timely. Um, we're going to put some stuff out, just put some, some stuff together we've sent to Dr. Hale um, here this week uh, that will be an upcoming newsletter that's information that came from United Healthcare and other sources that, um, uh, that will provide up-to-date health information for employees. Okay, that sounds good. I just, as a, as a board member, I just, I mentioned before, I just, I know that it's expense on our district. We pay, uh, Dr. White spoke eloquently about how we are one of the few districts who still continues to uh, ensure our employee, which I think is, is great. On the other hand, though, we have to look beyond that. Those employees have families, spouses, children, and we just, I mean, we want it the best for everyone. And um, I just want to know that um, as our, our district has done everything we can on our side to make that the best opportunity for our employees. That's my thing without, of course, jeopardizing our budget and, and those things, but right. also giving those employees. I mean, I think if you're working that hard and we know how hard they work, you need to be able to have insurance when you need it. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So thank you very much for that thank report. You. I appreciate it. And Mr. Bryant, yes, I have sir. a question, Mr. Frakes, also. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I know. I know. Well, I don't, I don't think it's a hard one, and it might not, okay. and it might not be for you either. Um, just first of all to say, uh, I don't know if you guys have yet received uh, what the anticipated uh, rate will be coming forward, and it's not necessary to, to say at this time. But I did see this morning that uh, in a case of property home insurance uh, in Florida, uh, you should expect an a increase in that Insurance. this coming year. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we've learned pretty much, too, that in terms of health care, that if we didn't get an increase, uh, that, that would be a very unique situation. Mm -hmm. Correct. But uh, I have no doubt uh, that COVID uh, has had an impact on health care in America in a lot of different ways okay. and may have had an impact in terms of uh, insurance and, and the coverages that are offered and the rate increases and, and all those kinds of things. 
which leads me to perhaps a stretch of a question. But do we know or is it possible that the, and I'll use the word they use, I won't use manta that fell from heaven, uh, <laughs> the stimulus money that we received uh, for COVID, uh, is it possible that any of those funds might be used to offset the cost of health insurance for our employees? Do we know an answer to that, or is I that something not. that we can look at? I do not. I'm sure that yeah. something we could explore. So that is something and that we can talk with Ms. Gallen about and right. uh, kind of look into that, explore that, and that we can get back with you. Okay. That If we could, that would offset some of the district costs, and, and that would be helpful uh, in a lot of ways to, to our own budget uh, in using those stimulus funds that were provided for COVID. Understood. All right. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frakes. And thank you, Mr. Chambers, for following through with my request on that. I appreciate yes, it. Yes, ma'am. All right. All right. Any, anybody else, Mr. Chambers? <laughs> <laughs> I don't see anybody running up here. So. <laughs> I, think, I think we're getting. I appreciate that. Right. All right. Here's your chance. So uh, we're going to go ahead and move down to board members' announcements and requests for information. And I'm going to start with Dr. Kelly. So, Dr. Kelly. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I just had two things. Uh, in addition to saying thank you to everybody that presented today, I know every time you do that, it takes you away from your real job to go and research and bring forward information that different ones of us have asked for. So thank you for that. But I did want to point out on item 17.3, I think we may have new titles for some of those, like maybe that one in our specific individual meetings might have been called operations, which was a broader title and included other departments. So before we vote on Monday night, I just wanted to throw that out there that we might want to have that cleaned up so that we're voting on the specific one you intended for us to be approving. And so that was just one thing. And um, the second thing is I very much appreciated the organizational chart information that you brought forward that does support your vision for Okaloosa schools and I like the changes. I think that they are adequate and appropriate, especially like the comment that they will be budget neutral or almost budget neutral. I think our public needs to hear that, that what we're doing is being good stewards of the budgets that we are presented with as your board members. That is one of the things that we are challenged with. That's one of the very uh, things that is pointed out in our job description. So thank you for taking care of that. I would like to add on to that that um, I would like to see it presented perhaps in the chart form with the boxes. I think that is commonly called an organogram. <laughs> organogram, that's the, the term for that, with the boxes that demonstrate the hierarchy of the levels of um, employees in a district or in any organization. So I'd like to see that in an organogram if that's possible. Well, that's definitely coming. Thank you. And then not to let the chair down, uh, I do have some dates for us. Do you recognize that we are only 30 school days left to the last day for students? 30 school days left. And 33 school days left to the last day of school for teachers this year. And more importantly, I know you'll love the fact that we are 82 days away from school starting back <laughs> in the fall. <laughs> So anyway, that's all I have, but thank you very much. Wow. And if you wouldn't mind, I'll slip out. I do have an 11 o'clock appointment in a neighboring town. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Get a ticket. <laughs> uh, Dr. White? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, first of all, I don't, I don't think there's really any way that I can express how, how grateful I am to our military forces that uh, have, have really defended this country and, and, and made us what, what we are. Uh, as, as the son of a military veteran, uh, married to the daughter of a military veteran, um, I too, Superintendent, have a great appreciation for the military and, and everything that they've done for us and continue to do. Uh, they really are the ones on the wall watching over us. Uh, also, APs, uh, I happen to know, uh, I haven't counted how many I served with, but I am so, so grateful to everything they do and did at the at the schools. Uh, I'll never forget sitting in a meeting with a group of parents and one of the parents turned to my lifelong friend and said, well, what do you do as the AP? 
And he looked at me and said, I do everything he doesn't want to. <laughs> <laughs> now, while that may not have been an exactly an accurate description, uh, in, in some cases it certainly fit. So uh, I'll just say that uh, our APs really are part of the backbone of our schools and, and they're the ones that, that really pull things together and, and make things work. So right. I'm, I'm very, very grateful to them too. And uh, Mr. Bryant, that's really all I have uh, at this point. Well, thank you, Dr. White and Ms. Avinchek. Okay. Well, I'm pretty active on uh, some social platforms, always trying to spread the positive news. But I have to say that the other day I was here for a meeting and I walked down to see one of our newest buses because I hadn't gotten up close and you can see it real well because it, that yellow shines, that others are kind of dull. And I walked up and uh, there was uh, one of our lead mechanics from here was out there and I asked him, introduced myself, talked with him a bit and asked him did he mind uh, using my AI here uh, to take a picture of me uh, with this new beautiful yellow bus and I posted it on my Facebook page and I want you to know that I've not put anything out in a long time that got as much attention as our new yellow bus and people love it I got comments I got cheers uh, it was it was great so again we're excited that we have that was that's number three out there I understand the other four is separated in the north and the south but uh, uh, the public's paying attention and that's that's uh, great for that I would like to do a quick uh, shout out today to a um, community group, uh, the Fort Walton Beach Women's Club. Uh, first of all, the Fort Walton Beach Women's Club is celebrating 100 of years of continued um, service to the community of Fort Walton this year. And their involvement with our school district goes way back to that 1921. They actually uh, started the, actually the first school uh, lunch program in that they delivered way back to the Camp Walton school days and all that. But, they're still working with our students, and I wanted to share that the, um, yesterday, members of the Women's Club went over to Silver Sands, and after asking uh, Ms. Wheat over there some things they needed, they took uh, resources and totally stocked that student store that they have, not only with school supplies, but also with the students get to uh, use their seahorse bucks, that's uh, the, the things they get, incentive things uh, to things, and so they stocked it with a lot of fun things that those students could purchase uh, with that. In addition, they have a program called S3, which works with Amy Dale, our Title I specialist, and they've adopted six Title I schools in the south end of the county, and they give them not only uh, school supplies, but toiletry items for many students who um, are even home and food insecure and also uh, issues every quarter a check to those schools for that principal to use uh, how are they need for those students. So I just want to thank, I know we have a lot of help from our community, but I just want to thank the Fort Walton Beach uh, Women's Club for that because um, they're really uh, working behind the scenes to help those students. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vancheck. And uh, I'll piggyback on the bus. I happen to be behind w one of the new ones up in Crestview the other day, and you're right, it does. Of course, we understand 21 means it's we got it this year. I know. I explained year. the number when I was when I took my picture. And actually. I was behind as it was going on Old Bethel. You can see it. You can definitely you? can see it. So, uh, <laughs> but thank you for that report, Miss uh, Gardner. And it's nice the buses are yellow um, with the pollen that we're dealing with right <laughs> yeah, now. That's that right. You don't really see the pollen as you, <laughs> as you do on my car. That, that's Just true. a quick shout out, of, of maybe a virtual pat on the back to our principals and our teachers mm -hmm. that are dealing with um, testing right now. Yeah. In a typical year, it's difficult, but with COVID and with online students coming in, they're just doing a remarkable job. Um, also, our district people that are assisting these schools to work through this FSA testing at this time. Um, again, they were doing a remarkable job hanging there. As Dr. Kelly said, spring break is just right around the corner. And um, I know the district's here to support them and encourage them any way possible. So hang in there, teachers, principals. Yeah. Yes. Anything else? All right. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. And I'll just close with uh, just to say 
thank you to Mr. Chambers, uh, and also thank you to Ms. Ivanchek, who, who started this town hall uh, meetings. And tomorrow, uh, Mr. Chambers and myself will be at Crestview High School to meet with those students uh, in the town hall format. So, uh, and I believe that one's going to be uh, recorded by the school district, too. I think they're going to have a video there, so we'll be able to share that. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, all of our assistant principals out there uh, for the job that they do. Uh, I, I will always say that we always have a like walls, but the principal and the assistant principals are the pillars. And uh, but without the assistant principals, the principals could could never do their job that we ask of them. And so we do appreciate all the assistant principals. And like Dr. White mentioned, uh, I too am the proud. Uh, son of an Army veteran, and my wife is a uh, proud daughter of an Air Force veteran. So uh, we do support the uh, Military Child Month, and we also support Autism Month, too. So a lot going on in the month of April. They're so. not going to let you off the hook tomorrow. So when you get with those students, <laughs> I've be, already, I've already be ready. Had, yeah, I've already had some students you know, that, know, that know me personally, and they're like, what kind of questions can we ask? of the superintendent you know they they you know the board members were just <laughs> I, I have those meetings with the parents yes they would call each other before they came yep. and they would say you get him on this and we're going to get him on that <laughs> so yep. maybe the kids are too that's right so be ready well and and also i just want to share with the fact that you know mr chambers uh you know the fact that he's done that with Ms. Banchek and myself and any of the board members that have requested his services uh, just shows you the direction that this board and the school district are going and I I appreciate the fact that you know we can go out there as a unified front and show the people you know what's going on in the school district all the positive things that are going on and yeah we, we understand we're not perfect but we are out there trying to show that hey, we're working together, we're trying to do what's best for the next generation of, of schools and students and everybody else that's involved. So, uh, you know, Mr. Chambers, I do appreciate that because, you know, you could say no, and uh, but you don't. You always look out, you, you try to figure out a way to make it happen with all of us. And so I do appreciate that. And I know my colleagues appreciate that too. So thank you, sir. Thank and you. what a great civics lesson. Yes. Okay, we can tell. We're yes. already on it, so yes. great. Well, and speaking of also next Friday, we'll be visiting schools up on the north end. So uh, I'm really excited about that. Uh, you know, we're going to go as far north as Laurel Hill. So I, I know Mr. Chambers is looking forward to that, and I am too to be able to show off all the great things that are going on in a few of our schools up on the north end. So you, is that a town hall? No, uh, this oh. is just I, I, visiting. I, just the visiting. So. Mm -hmm. Great. And we're going to do it on the last day before spring break. Right. So. Our teachers and principals, they really do appreciate mm -hmm. your appearance, and they want to show off what they're doing. So yep. It does mean a lot. Yes, I agree. All right, so we do have public hearing on Monday night. We have three items up, and um, Dr. Kelly has re requested uh, on 17.3, Mr. McGinnis, that's what I was uh, trying to get your attention on. She did have a request there on a kind of, uh, cleaning that up a little bit, I guess, on the job description. So we'll start off with 17.1, public hearing for adoption of a new job description for STEM coach. 17.2, public hearing for adoption of a new job, job description for specialist digital media and communications, something I'm very excited about. And I know Mr. Chambers is excited about that too. And 17.3, public hearing for adoption of a new job description for director one facilities planning and maintenance. And we'll go around the room since everybody's already been up to the screen, except for Ms. Scallon. She, anything that you'd like to go over? All right. So with that, this meeting's adjourned.